What I am about to share with you will seem impossible, but it is a true story as reported in the news this week. Sumio Sanaga, 66 years old, lived with his brother and sister in their town of Kazukai in Japan. His brother and sister, a few years younger than uh, Sumio, lived with him as well. So it was the three of them as siblings. None of them were married. They all lived together. Apparently, back in 2015, Sumio went missing. As his siblings believed that he had left to presumably go for a walk and never came back. And so they waited for his return and waited and waited and he never came back. They decided a year later to notify the authorities, hey, our, our brother's missing. When did you last see him? A year ago. Wait, what? And they put out a search for him, never able to find him. Well, after five years of waiting for their brother to return or be found with no such success, no such success, Sumio's younger sister, who at that point is 69 years old, decided that she wanted to go ahead and use her older brother's room for herself. And so she decided that she would clean it up as it had not been touched since he went missing back in 2015. Sumia did not get very far into the process until she discovered an unclothed, skeletonized body. She says, I found something that I think are human bones. She informed the police, and when police officers arrived on the scene, they confirmed that the corpse was indeed human though they were not initially able to determine the individual's age or sex, investigators believe there is a high probability that the body is sumios. Okay, there are so many crazy things about this story. Like just this last part of the story, there's a high probability that the body we found is sumios. Who else could it be? How many other dead bodies are hanging around their house? In his room? But one of all the crazy things about the story that sort of strike me is the fact that they waited not a day, not a week, not a month, they waited a year before they decided to notify the authorities and ask for help. Hey, can you help us find our brother? I just wanna know, I just want you to know, for any of you that I'm friends with, I will not wait that long before we go find help to try to find you. But how crazy of a story is that? To have your sibling go missing, and it turns out has died in his own room, but you never even looked there for him, and that's where he was the entire time. I don't know how they didn't smell it, quite honestly. But as I hear about this story, I'm struck by the part I said, which was that they waited that long until they started asking for help from authority. And I'm reminded for us as Christians, sometimes we can surprisingly make the same mistake. That we can find ourselves in a situation that we did not expect, that we did not plan for, and decide we're gonna take matters into our own hands and wait surprisingly longer than we should ever have or anybody would have expected before we asked authority not human, but divine, for help. Before we went to the Lord in prayer and said, God, please help me. Well, tonight I trust from Matthew chapter seven that temptation should be put to rest as you see how gladly, how eagerly, how promisingly the Son of God speaks about God the Father and his desire to hear from us and respond. If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter seven is our text for this evening. If you're new to Grace Church and maybe investigating Christianity, this is a great place to be. If you don't have a Bible, we have them for free. We love to give them away uh, at the Welcome Center. Afterwards, you can feel free to just come up and say, hey, I hear you've got free Bibles. I'd love to get one of those. I want to read one of that myself. 
Uh, in the meantime, you can just listen. Some of the verses we'll put up on the screen outside of our main text. But it's our practice at Grace Church. We work through God's Word because I don't believe there's anything better that I could ever offer you or anybody else could offer you than what God has already given all of us, which is His Word. And so we want to just kind of put it out there and explain it and then think together how to live in light of it. And Matthew chapter 7 is where we are. We've been working through the Gospel of Matthew. This is coming into the end of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached in human history, the most recorded text ever known, and we're coming into some significant verses. Our text for this evening is Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Listen as I read to you this passage. Jesus says the following, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? This is our text for this evening, and a bit of a spoiler alert as to the main point of our text. The main point here is that Jesus is teaching that prayer to a loving Father is always effective. Prayer to a loving Father is always effective. And now let's kind of begin to break this down in sort of two major understandings that Jesus wants the listeners to understand and us today, the readers. First of all, Jesus says, we need to learn to pray with persistence. We need to learn to pray with persistence. You'll notice there in verse 7 how he keeps using a different type of term but to say the same thing. He speaks about asking. He speaks about seeking. He speaks about knocking. And his point here is he's talking about the conversation of prayer. This is not in any way the only time Jesus has been talking about prayer. If you were with us a number of weeks back, we were going through what's known as the disciples' prayer, more commonly the Lord's prayer, but really is for disciples of Jesus to pray in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 13. But even before then, Jesus was correcting abuses of prayer. Uh, later on, he speaks about prayer and the significance of it, about not being anxious and how we should be trusting the Lord. Well, now he comes back to the topic of prayer. And this is important. It's important because, as we see in Luke chapter 11, the disciples wanted to know how does the Son of God talk to God the Father? I don't know if it's striking you as odd, if not maybe just distinct, but think of all the things the disciples thought the ministry of Jesus would have seen him do, let alone heard him do. They would have seen him walk on water. They would have seen him cast out demons. They, some of them would have seen him turn water into wine, his first miracle. And yet, when the disciples make a request of Jesus, they don't ask him to teach them how to do those things. They ask him to teach them how to pray because they recognized the significance of what it meant to have the Son of God teach the people of God how to have a conversation with God. And I say that because it's noticeable to us, even as we sit and listen to these words, as we read them with our own eyes, we hear them with our own ears, to recognize Jesus is answering the conversation that perhaps many of you even still have today. How do I talk to God? What do I say? What are the, what are the words? What's so striking is that when Jesus talks about prayer, he doesn't talk about it oftentimes like we're maybe default to think about, like what kind of vocabulary should I use? What sort of posture should I take? Should I do it with my eyes closed, my eyes open? Like, what sort of the mechanics of prayer? Jesus isn't teaching about that. Jesus is teaching about a relationship. And even that relationship, as we saw earlier in Matthew chapter 6, a relationship that's really built upon our Father in heaven. 
And then as we get into the prayer request that's listed there in verses nine and through verse 11, or excuse me, nine and 10 of chapter six, you're praying first for God's glory before we think about man's need. But now as we come into this text tonight, Jesus, when he's teaching us about prayer, he says we should pray with persistence. With persistence. You need to be continually in prayer. Oftentimes in our weakness, we will admit our prayer life is lacking. Perhaps you can acknowledge that even now as you're having it talked about. The disciples were oftentimes the same way. It's interesting that everything that they saw Jesus do, that this is what they wanted to know. They wanted to understand. And let's take a look at these words, this idea here of asking, of seeking, of knocking. This idea here of seeking is this meaning of the praying person does not necessarily know exactly what should be said necessarily, but keeps asking in order that what is being said would be heard with confidence. And it's being sought even through the scriptures. I sometimes will gather with Christians, perhaps you can identify with this as well, if we were to gather together, the four of us, and we're to say, hey, let's have a prayer time together, and like, okay, that, that sounds noble, sounds good, I, I suppose. Um, please tell me as the pastor, you're gonna be the one praying? Like, okay, I, I'm, I'll do some praying. What about you? And you're like, well, um, I don't really feel comfortable praying in front of pastors, because what if you're like, you know, grading my prayer? What if I say something wrong? What if you're like, oh, oh, no, no, don't, don't say that to God. No, I just, I don't know. I kind of feel uncomfortable praying in front of pastors. Like, okay, well, let's put you in a different prayer group with other people because I don't make you feel uncomfortable. I don't think you should feel that way, but let's put you with somebody else. And okay, I'll pray with some other people. And you're like, okay, okay, so pastors are here. We can pray now. We can relax. Okay, good. And like, okay, what are we going to pray for? Like, I don't know. You tell me. What are we going to pray for? Like, well, I don't know. You got like any sick ants? You got any job interviews coming up? You got any struggling sins you want to maybe share? We talk. Okay, never mind, never mind. Somebody else's sin, maybe? I have a friend who lives next door to a guy who knows a girl who works with somebody. They say that they're struggling with laziness. I don't know what that's about, but we could pray for them. (laughs) I think sometimes Christians don't even necessarily know what to pray. And it's not necessarily even knowing what to pray. It's like, okay, God, there's this job that I'm interviewing for, and I don't know, God, if it's your will that I get this or not, but I'm gonna pray about it, that God, I would pray that you would, if it's your will, that you would bless this interview and that you would provide for that job because in providing for that job, you allow me to provide for my needs. But God, at the same time, I don't know if this is what you have for me because you might not have that for me because you got something else for me that I can't yet see. So as much as I'm praying for this job, I'm praying for my faith to believe in you more than just this job will provide. But maybe it's the job. But I'm talking another level of seeking, which is what happens when you run out of the prayer requests that have been offered, what do you then say to God? Friends, this is where the scriptures help us so much to take the word and to pray it back to God, to to take the scripture and to say, God, I'm I'm here asking, I'm here seeking, I want your will to be done. I I want you to show yourself to be a good father. Would you grow my faith? You see me being anxious, right? Last Sunday we talked about this in Matthew chapter six, 25 to 34, a brief passing reference that I gave to you, how we can even be tempted this way. It's not just the asking, not just the seeking. He even gives this imagery of knocking. You know what you do on a closed door that you don't have a key to? You knock with the hopes that the person on the other side will unlock it and open it for you. So it's an acknowledgement you can't pass through it without the person on the other side opening it for you. So you knock. And if you know you have the right address, you don't walk to the next house. You stay right where you are on the porch and you knock again. And if you hear them as being home, you're like, I know you're home. I ain't going anywhere, I'm gonna keep knocking. Friends, there is a persistent understanding here in prayer to the Lord that Jesus wants to commend his followers to recognize. I'm reminded of what Paul says in Romans chapter eight, verse 26 and 27. 
He says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What prayer is, is the recognition of what you cannot, but what God can. I mean, let's just think of the, those immediate context. Just last week, we were in Romans, excuse me, Romans, we were in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Now, if you think about this, and just taking that text as the difficulty of the text, because in, Rome, in Matthew chapter 7, he's talking about don't judge people in the same manner which you're going to be, ju- you're judging others, you're going to be But then he talks about dealing with the sin in other people's life only after you deal with your sin. But then in verse 6, he talks about being discerning and where you stop preaching the gospel. You're like, that just seems all very complex. I feel like to do verse 6 is to be judgmental. So how do I know when I'm not and when I am? You pray, you ask, you seek, you knock. You recognize God I do not know what is best, but would you guide me by the desires of my heart, by the actions that I take, by the relationships you give me, may I honor you with them, and may I be humble enough to acknowledge it at times when I fail that I can learn from that and then return to honoring you. Jesus is saying here so commendably and encouragingly, look at what he says in verse eight, everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks it will be opened. Jesus is not teaching entitlement here. We should be clear about this. Jesus is not teaching a transactional relationship with God like God's kind of obligated to you now. You said a few words to him. He kind of feels like his reputation is on the line. So if he didn't show up and do something, you're not going to think as highly of him. And therefore, he needs to kind of show up and do some stuff. So you kind of keep thinking big thoughts about God. It's not what he's saying. He's also not saying, wow, you've done the right thing. You've kind of done the password for God. You've kind of unlocked the doors of heaven. And so you're kind of entitled now that whatever you ask, whatever you think, whatever you want, it's yours. It's not what he's saying. This is not a genie's bottle that you rub and you get anything you want. This is not a trip to Santa Claus at the mall that you sit up on God's lap and just anything you want for Christmas, it's yours throughout the entire year. The Bible safeguards against such thinking. I mean, understandably, even as we think about Luke chapter 11, this idea of everyone here is this idea of everyone who is pursuing God, who is seeking God, God will answer, right? I mean, verse 8, everyone who asks, who seeks, who finds, who knocks, the idea here is is that those who are pursuing God. We also learn from 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, it's those who are living in obedience. Listen to what 1 John says. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. We also recognize for Christians, it's living in obedience with the right motives. James warns us. I mean, in one sense, James chapter 2 says, hey, you have not because you ask not. But... James also says in James chapter four, verse three, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. If we can be honest, sometimes our prayer request to God is in the right direction but for the wrong desires. We're bringing it to the Lord, well done. Continue that. But what we're wanting is really something wrong that either we are aware of or maybe we're not even aware of and God is not gonna answer that according to how we are asking and the way, the reasons that we're asking for it. Sometimes if we're honest, sometimes we bring our idols, our desires to God that we're like, God, I will if you will. Well, that, that, that's a very and wise, to put it very kindly, unbiblical and sinful, to put it more accurately, way to talk to the Lord. So instead what we're saying is, God, here is my life, here is my desire, here is my ambition, here is my plans, here, here are my hopes, but, but Lord, your will be done on earth, in my life, in this place, at this time, as it is in heaven. 
Some of you want to be married and you're not. Some of you want to have children and you do not. Some of you want to buy your first house and you do not. Some of you are paying, want to pay off student loans and you have not. Some of you want to go to school and you have not. So some of you have a number of desires on face value are in and of themselves inherently immoral and wrong. You're not to be faulted for those desires. But the question is, are you willing to take those desires to the Lord and have him answer them, but not according to necessarily how you thought it was going to be best to be answered? And the time and the way the season and the situation. But with this confidence, your heavenly Father knows what is best for you, loves you, and provides perfectly on time for you every time. Is knowing that enough for you? So Jesus says we should pray with Persistence. Secondly, Jesus says we should pray with confidence. Pray with confidence. This brings us back here to this idea what you ask for, you receive, if not even better. Because why? Look at verses 9 through 11. Look at what he says. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Some of you know, some of you do not know. I am the father of three sons. I have a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 17-year-old. I love my sons. I am so thankful for my sons. It is not uncommon for my sons to hear me just say randomly, I love you. They'll be sitting in the room, I'll open the door, just pop in the door and say, I love you, and just close the door. And just, I got it, that's all I got. Or they'll be walking by, I'll give them a hug, and say, I love you. And so you think, well, that sounds weird. Others like, that sounds cool. I wish my dad did that. The point is, I do it all the time. I do. I love my sons. And I love to bless my sons. I don't mean like bless them like it spoiled way. Like, no, they need to learn how to grow up and be responsible and work and be thankful and all the things that you think should be responsible adulthood. I recognize that. But at the same time, I want to be a loving father. But at the same time, my children are more acquainted, more familiar with, ironically, my sin more than anybody else in this room. So arguably, what's surprising is that I love my sons more than any one of you love my sons. I don't blame you for that. It's okay. You're so cool. But my sons have also had me sin against them more than anybody else in this room has sinned against them. So am I, am I, do I really love them or not? Am I just a hypocrite or not? Like, what, where am I with my relationship with my sons? Well, the problem is my love as a dad to my sons, is like any other human parent's love for their child, even the best of parents, of which I don't put myself in that category, but even the best of parents are going to share, which is it's going to fall short, significantly short of our Heavenly Father's love for us. Because what you see here in the text is Jesus is grabbing a hold of a point of comparison saying, hey, what you need to recognize is the love that you have for each other is seemingly logical, and he gives this example about how much is like a dad gonna have his child ask for food, like, here's a snake, here's a stone. You're like, what's up with the snake, snake and stone thing? Well, just as a quick kind of cultural explanation, this idea of this small bread, small loaf of bread here, kind of this similar like a, a Palestinian rock, like a small loaf of bread. Well, he's not gonna like, well, here you ask for bread, here's a rock. Or like, oh, I have some fish. Like, oh, you asked for a fish. Here's a snake, like a, an eel-sized catfish in the Sea of Galilee. Like, here's this instead. Like, it's a nonsensical, impossible, no dad would do that. But then Jesus makes this statement. And it's a pretty stunning, and honestly, if we're, we're going to be really kind of honest, for some of us, it's kind of offensive to our modern-day sensibilities about, like, don't hurt people's feelings. He says, if you being evil can figure this lesson out, how much more does your heavenly father understand this lesson? Now, what's so surprising about what Jesus does here with the statement about evil is there's no like, 
let me pull the car over and have a conversation with you about what you might not understand, which is you guys are actually a little bit more jacked up than you realize. Jesus is saying something in passing about the human race, about human nature that's true for every man, woman, and child from the beginning of time since the fall until present and beyond, until Jesus comes back, which is all of us are like a corrupted computer drive. We have a virus that affects us. We do not work as we were originally intended and created and designed. That virus is sin. And it doesn't just stay within our own life, it spreads to all of our relationships. It affects everything we touch, the things that we say, the very motives we have, we're sinful. Now, for some of you who are not Christians, this might not be the kind of way you frame the world's problems, but this is kind of through the lens, the binoculars, the way in which through the lens of Scripture, how the Bible teaches us what's wrong with the world. What's wrong with the world is not bad policies and politicians and bad governments and incomplete uh, initiatives for the neighborhood and all these other kind of problems. And I'm not to say that those are not problems. They're just not the ultimate explanation behind all the ultimate problems we have. The ultimate problem we all share in common as a point of solidarity is sin. In the words of Jesus here, evil. The reason this is an important observation is because his audience didn't seem like they needed any more explanation on this. He just said it and he went on to teach his point. Let me not make sure that this audience doesn't need a little bit of explanation. Because the reality is, every one of us is removed from God in relationship, natural, on our own, apart from God, if it is not for the good news of Jesus Christ. You have a creating holy God who has righteously created us, has authority over us, but we, from very beginnings of our days on earth, conceived in sin, rebel against God. We want our way from the beginning, every time, all the time. We see this in our youngest of children, and even though we grow up and we can maybe be a little bit more polite about it, it works its way out in the pores of our soul and our life. That sin that separates us from God, God will judge. Why? Because the thing you want about God to be true is true. He is just. But he's also merciful. So he sent his son, the one we're reading right here, Jesus, to be a substitute to live perfectly like nobody in this room or on this world has ever lived perfectly in obedience to God's word to then die sacrificially that anybody who would then believe in him having died sacrificially, receiving upon him the wrath of God that otherwise we deserve because Jesus did not sin, but 2 Corinthians 5, he received what we otherwise deserve so that we might become the righteousness of God and then resurrected from the grave three days later. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, there is no reason for faith that all those who put their faith in Christ could be confident, could be assured that once what separated them, sin, awaiting them wrath for an eternity has now been removed and what's now been given to them is justification, ransom, adoption, love, so that anytime they talk to this God, he hears them as one of his newly adopted children who promises to answer every request we were to make. He's saying, you can be confident if this is you, if this is you as a follower of Christ, you can be confident that God hears your prayers. God's pattern of dealing with God's children is what we're seeing here in this prayer life before us. This idea of God working. Friends, does that encourage you? For those of you who are not a Christian, ironically, the point is still the same. And here's the point. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock, if you ask God to forgive you and put your faith in Christ, he will indeed answer Every Christian in this room who sits beside you began the relationship with God the exact same way. Prayer, which was an expression of faith. 
an act of surrender. It says, God, I can know more, but you can. Where I am evil, you are righteous. Where I deserve to be judged, you are forgiving. Where I have no hope, you offer me rescue. So Jesus offers this. He offers this. Today we see in the news um, great amount of civil unrest. This is not unique to this year. It's not unique to even our lifetime. It's not unique to our country. You can see this happening in other countries around the world even as we speak. And for some legitimate reasons, others maybe not as legitimate, but nevertheless for some legitimate reasons. And one of the approaches that's often taken is when you are in a season of discord, a season of just complete just, you know, dismay of all of what you're going through is that you want to kind of put yourself in front of the authority so that they cannot ignore you, they cannot deny you, they cannot uh, you know, forget about you. And so you'll have people who will do this. You have people who like camp out in front of the White House or camp out in front of their local police station or camp out in front of the local state house. They want to be seen because they want to be heard because they want to camp out in order that in doing so they'll be heard. Jesus is saying, hey, camp out in front of heaven with the confidence that every time you ask, you'll be heard. Every time you knock, that door will be opened. Again, not because it's an expression of that anything you want, you get, but because God who cares for his people and has always cared for his people will continue to do so. If you have needs, be praying with persistence and be praying with confidence, why? Not because we are great, but because our God is great. And that's the key here in verse 11, your Father who is in heaven. Which brings us back to again the significance of this statement throughout the Sermon on the Mount, what it meant to have a Father, a perfect Father, unlike many earthly fathers, a perfect Father who was divine, who cared for his children. Briefly, let me just share some implications of this with you as a way to kind of think through what this looks like, putting some street clothes on this. First of all, first implication is, let's trade token prayers for consistent prayers. Let's trade token prayers for consistent prayers. Here's what I mean by this. If I ask you if you are a praying person, probably a number of you, maybe not all of you, but a number of you probably say, I'm a praying person. Great. And if I was to kind of get you to tease it out from me, like what does that look like if you'd be a praying person? You might say, well, I mean, I, I believe in prayer. Okay. Um, I do pray. Okay. When do you pray? Um, well, usually when I have a, something to eat, I might kind of stop and thank God for the food I'm about to eat. Okay. I'm not against thankfulness for food. That's fine. Um, what else do you pray? If someone asks me to pray, I probably will write it down maybe and pray later. Okay. Okay, good. What else do you pray? Uh, if I'm in the middle of like a hardship, like boom, something happened, tragedy, bad doctor's visit, bad news from a friend, or just, a, just a difficult relationship, I might pray right then and there. Okay, okay, that's good. All that's fine. But if you're not careful, prayer will be like a, I know I should, but I don't really develop this as a relational opportunity. It's more of a spiritual obligation than a relational opportunity, but which I get to enjoy having a conversation with God and having him direct, based upon his word, the desires of my heart and see how he answers prayer in my life. So we wanna trade token prayers for consistent prayers. Secondly, we wanna be confident in praying because of God's character. We wanna be confident in praying because of God's character. I'm reminded of a text that we studied uh, before in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter three. This is significance of what it says here, verse 23 of Ephesians chapter three. You can just write that down. Ephesians three, verse 23 and 24. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. 
See, I am confident in prayer, not because of the words I'm using, not because of the posture I'm taking, not because of the amount of time in which I'm doing it. I'm confident in prayer because of the one I'm praying to. My confidence is in God. Third implication, enjoy the benefits of the gospel. Enjoy the benefits of the gospel. What do I mean by this? I mean, prayer is an opportunity to be reminded that you have a relationship because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Like it's an opportunity to be reminded that you can be confident in this conversation because of what Jesus has completed on the cross. When he said it is finished, it is finished. There's, there is not like your faith plus your prayers, your faith plus your baptism, your faith plus your good works, your faith plus your giving, your faith plus your, your morality, your faith plus your, your work for the Lord, your faith plus your service. It is your faith alone in Christ alone because of his grace alone. And when you pray, you're reminded that it's not because of how good your prayer is, it's because of how good great God is that gives you that confidence in prayer. And the gospel brings you back to this. The benefits of the gospel is then that you get to enjoy this confidence that you have. You have confident access to God. You can be assured that when you pray, he hears. 